right, I want to continue our series on developing a biblical worldview, continuing to teach on the biblical worldview about purpose, the Christian answer to the great purpose questions of life. Now, what if you haven't been here, your worldview, everybody has a worldview, and your worldview is how you see the world. It's how you, it's the prism through which you analyze events, make decisions. It's a comprehensive system of thinking. And even if you don't know you have a worldview, you have one. And worldviews answer the great questions of life, like who is God? What is man? Why is there evil in the world? And the one we're addressing last week and this week is the purpose questions of why am I here? Why am I alive? Does my life have any purpose or meaning? This is probably, of all the questions, one of the most commonly recognized as deep. Dr. Miles Monroe, in his book, In Pursuit of Purpose, says that the deepest craving of the human spirit is to find some sense of significance and relevance. The search for purpose in life is the ultimate pursuit of mankind. Again, if you weren't here, the definition of purpose is the original intent in the mind of the creator that motivated him to create a thing. Purpose explains its reason for existence. Now today, uh, America is inundated with worldviews that oppose the biblical worldview like Darwinism, nihilism, socialism, communism. Those worldviews uh, answer the question, does life have meaning, with an answer of no. You are, you are less than what the biblical worldview holds you to be. And what we're seeing today in America is the uh, disintegration of a generation of purposeless young people and rising suicide rates. Now this is not a new problem. Back in 1947, uh, state congressman Francis Miller said, man is troubled today, more troubled than at any previous time on this planet. He's troubled because he does not know, though he wants to know, the meaning of his own life. Why is he here in this world? Has man any significant destiny on earth? What is it all about anyway? The Christian religion provides the answers to these questions. Our text we'll use again from last week is Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4 where the Bible says the Lord has made everything for its own purpose. Everything that is has a purpose. We taught you, I'll review the seven principles of purpose. God is a God of purpose. Everything God has made has a purpose. Sometimes purpose is not known. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing, because purpose is only found in the mind of the Creator. And purpose is the key to fulfillment in life. Now again, I'm not going to, we went through those last week. I'm not gonna, just wanted to give them to you again because they're very powerful, worthy of memorization actually. But tonight, I want to go a little deeper and make a personal application to our lives, talking about the discovery of personal purpose and how it's always connected to the time and place where you were born and where you live. God made you for a purpose and he sovereignly ordained the place of your birth, the nation in which you would live and even the time in history that you would be born. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. 
everything has a purpose. And tonight I'm going to talk about how there is a time for every purpose to be discovered and, and fulfilled. God's purpose for your life is closely connected to where and when you were born. Why were you born in America? Why were you born to live during this particular time if you're young? If you're old, why are you still around? I always tell people if you're older and you're still there, God's not through with you. He still has a purpose for you. So the question is why here? Why now? I'm going to tell you why. It is because God has a purpose and a plan for your life that is necessary for the present generation in which you live. You are alive now to fulfill a purpose necessary in this generation. God not only planned a purpose for your life, he predetermined the point in time where your purpose would be needed. And my message tonight is entitled, For Such a Time as This. For Such a Time as This. Now, if you know your Bible, our text is taken from the book of Esther, the story of a young Jewish queen in a Gentile court where evil political powers were threatening the extermination of the people of God by a federal mandate. Sound familiar? In chapter 4, Esther's godly mentor, a man named Mordecai, sends her a word of wisdom about how God has placed her to fulfill her purpose in that moment of danger and crisis. He said, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this. What a word for all of us. That God not only prepared us for purpose, but places us at this particular point in history where that purpose can be fulfilled. I love this other translation of that verse. Perhaps this is the moment for which you have been created. Of course, we know that Esther went on indeed had come to the kingdom for that particular time and ended up saving her people when they were in peril. And here's what I'm saying tonight. God creates each one of us for a purpose and he causes us to be born at a time in history where the purpose will meet the need of the current generation. In a sense, we can all say we have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I hope you leave here tonight with a revelation of that. Because our country is at a crossroads. One of the most dangerous times in my lifetime, and I've been here a while. Many Christians are confused. Many of our political leaders are loons. But this has all happened before. And in the midst of it, God always raises up a people like the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. There was a remnant of faithful people within God's nation. In this case, the tribe of Issachar. And the men, the sons, knew, understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. This text tells us that the people of God have to understand the times before they can know what they ought to do. Did you hear what I just said? Those things are connected together. There's an importance to purpose, but there's an importance to the timing of purpose. 
if we're going to fulfill our purpose in for such a time as this we're going to have to understand the times and the problem we understand today and I want to share with you is the fact that we are living in the midst of a purposeless generation why do so few of our young people seem fulfilled why so many are unhappy why are suicide rates among young people at record levels man even Hollywood's noticing the actor Benedict Cumberbatch said the number of people my age and younger who are fiercely bright overeducated and underemployed and who are politicized and purposeless really upsets me it is soul destroying in his classic book, The True Believer, A Social Study of the Nature of Mass Movements, it's considered a classic, the German Eric Hoffer explained how young people end up in radical socialist groups like MS-13 and Black Lives Matter. He said, people haunted by the purposelessness of their lives try to find meaning either by dedicating themselves to a holy cause or by nursing a fanatical grievance. A mass movement offers them unlimited opportunities for both. Many Americans, not just young people, are succumbing to the temptation to find their purpose in some fanatical movement, some ungodly worldview, some anti-American agenda. You will notice that most of the rioters, looters, and mass murderers that we see on the news every night are young men without a purpose. Presbyterian minister Charles Henry Parkhurst, who exposed the political corruption in New York City back in the 1890s, connected law-breaking to a lack of purpose. He said purposelessness, purposelessness is the fruitful mother of crime. That's very profound, beloved. When I see the video cam footage of those young men, and you've all seen it, breaking into the stores, looting the stores, smashing jewelry cases, taking merchandise out I, I I you know it's shocking but after a while you begin to say what's going on here and I'm convinced it's because they have no real sense of purpose for their lives I see people gathering for these stupid demonstrations they're like the vampires they only come out at night Cities are pretty calm all day, but when the night comes, here they come. And, and they're, they're out there sometimes by the hundreds, by the thousands, holding these pr protest signs. And I'm not against protesting. I believe there's a place for it. But I'm just, what I'm trying to say is I keep wondering, I don't know about you, but I keep wondering, don't these people have a life? Don't they have a job? Don't they need to get their rest so they can go to work the next day? And the truth of finding out is, no, they don't. Actually, they're getting paid many times to go out and do what they do by radical anarchists who hate America. I heard just this week that military recruitment is off by 50%. And now it is at the lowest levels in decades, even since the Vietnam War. The Army recruiters, the Navy, the Air Force, they're not able to recruit young people. Not enough young people to fill the ranks. Our, arm, our standing army is below acceptable levels and getting worse every day. And you have to wonder why, what's happened? And the truth is, it's like what happened in Vietnam. The young people don't believe in their country anymore. They don't see a purpose 
for what America stands for. Our professional athletes kneel during the national anthem. Patriotism among young people is rare. And you have to, you just, you just have to wonder why. What, what's going on here? Miles Monroe said, this is a generation that seems to have lost its sense of purpose. They're out of touch with the values, morals, and convictions that build strong families, secure communities, healthy societies, and prosperous nations. It doesn't seem to bother some people. And one of the reasons I think the military is going down is it's being feminized. I just saw this week they're, they're allowing soldiers to wear high heel shoes, men to wear high heel shoes and dress up if they want. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that barracks. I was in the army. Floor of army bunks, too deep. Probably 50, 60 men in a, in a room. I don't think I want some guy parading around in drag in high heel shoes and God knows what else. The worldview set forth in the Word of God keeps us connected with the values, morals, and convictions that once made America great. The polls tell us today about 80% of Americans believe the country is heading in the wrong direction. 80%. Now, it's very easy to pile all the problems onto the president, and he is a problem. But there's a bigger issue, and that is the purposelessness of our generation. Miles Monroe said the value of life decreases and the quality of existence diminishes when a generation loses its sense of destiny and purpose. The craziness of current American culture shows we've lost our purpose. We preserve nature, but we kill babies. We build solid houses, but we cannot construct lasting homes. We're smarter, but not wiser, bigger, but not stronger. We know more, but we understand less. We go faster, but we get nowhere. We conquer space, but can't conquer our habits. We protect our whales, but abuse our children. We go to the moon, but wander away from our homes. And we flirt with fantasy to avoid reality. This didn't come overnight. It's been building on our watch in our generation. 20 years ago, the late, great UCLA professor Warren Bennis said, America has lost its edge because it's lost its way. We forgot why we're here. We've forgotten the purpose of our founding. We talk about freedom and democracy, but we practice license and anarchy. As a nation cannot survive without public virtue, so it can't progress without a common vision. Vision is another word for purpose in Pastor Ray's thesaurus. Vision is an important part of purpose. If we have no biblical worldview, that our purpose on earth is to demonstrate the kingdom of God and see the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven, we have no hope. Solomon said it this way in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. That's actually not a very good translation. A better one is where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. I love the apologetic study Bible. It says, without revelation, the people run wild. This is what we see today. People are running wild. They're going nuts. They're absolutely crazy. If I see one more cross-dress, transgender school teacher bragging about how her little second graders are so quick to accept her philosophy of sexuality and how thrilled she is to be teaching these children. 
I'm going to vomit. Again, Miles Monroe, where there's no purpose, there's no self-control, no moral conviction, and no ethical boundaries. Am I oversimplifying it to say that the primary difference between people is between those who have purpose and those who don't? Dr. Monroe said purpose is the master of motivation and the mother of commitment. It is the source of enthusiasm and the womb of perseverance. Purpose gives birth to hope and instills the passion to act. Without vision, we can only exist. We feel no passion for living. Neither do we have the reason to, a reason to wake up in the morning. This is the condition of our current culture. I have to tell you, and I'm not bragging except on the Lord Jesus Christ, but I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and have no purpose. I don't know how people live with it. I don't know how you can wake up in the morning and hate to get up. I don't get it. If I made alarm clocks, there would be no snooze button. What do you need a snooze button for? Well, I wanted to lay here a few more minutes before I have to get up. Well, then why didn't you set the alarm for a few minutes later? I tell you, when you have purpose, you don't need an alarm clock. God wakes me up every morning. 3, 3.30. The other day I overslept. It was 4. And you know, when I, when I opened my eyes, I, it's like I'm not, I'm like, oh, 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 I don't feel so good this morning. Oh, I didn't sleep that good last night. I'm going I'm to tell you, I get up and head for my, the coffee pot. <laughs> my original purpose is caffeine. But to get in the Word, to sit down, open my Bible in a quiet and, and, and connect with God and pray and, and think about His Word. But today, what I'm saying is if we, want to, if we want to know what to do, we've got to understand the times. It's time to call God's people to God's purpose. The first thing we need to tell God's people, the young as well as the old, is that there's a reason you're living in the nation at this time. Dr. Monroe said, your existence is evidence that this generation needs something that your life contains. Did you hear that? The fact that you exist, the fact that you are alive right now is evidence that this generation needs something that your life contains. Something that the sovereign, transcendent, omniscient God foreknew before the foundation of the world and purposing to create you in your mother's womb and have you born into a nation at a particular time. Something he wired into you. A gift, a calling, an inspiration, a talent, an attitude, a heart. You were born for such a time as this. How much time are you spending finding out what that is? To the young people, I'd come in to study of how purpose worked in the lives of men like Joseph and David. Joseph knew he was special as a teenager, but he didn't know the meaning of the expression of it. He just, God gave him some dreams about promotion. Today we got a whole bunch of young people, their parents are telling them how great they are. You're just so great, you're my little princess. Well, you're my little prince. Well, you're just so wonderful, you're so special. When they haven't done anything, don't make the bed, don't pick up their clothes. Excuse me. Joseph knew he was special, 
but he didn't know what it would look like until he sat on the throne of Egypt. Which God didn't tell him that was going to be 14, 15 years later. God didn't tell him he was going to be betrayed by his brethren, sold by a slave as a slave into another alien culture, falsely accused of sin, something he didn't do, and thrown into a, an Egyptian prison for 14 years. But let me tell you the, the purpose of God and the timing of God. I love Psalm 105, 19 to 22 that talks about Joseph. It says, and until the time that his word came, until the time that his word came, his purpose would be fulfilled. The word of the Lord tested him. Then the king sent and released him, the ruler of the people, let him go free. And he made him lord of the house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Let me tell you the purpose of God to you and I may seem delayed. You may be called to some great thing and be frustrated because obstacles keep coming up and difficulties and finances and relationships and things begin to block you and you feel frustrated it's the word of the lord testing you are you going to hold on to faith in god and god's purpose for you and trust him for the timing of it because there will come a time the another verse i didn't read it says and they they put his feet in in fetters of iron but the hebrew says and iron came into his soul let me tell you, I've got a sovereign God that even your difficulties is working character into you. He's working perseverance. He's working patience. He's working new, fresh faith. David was a shepherd boy, tending his father's flock on the hillsides. Just sitting out there, brum, brum, writing worship songs to God. And then suddenly he's on the field of battle, bringing down a giant and delivering the whole nation. But his full purpose wasn't even fulfilled then. It was 13 years later when he was crowned the king of all Israel and Judah. He was Israel's greatest king. You know what his epitaph is? Hundreds of years later in the New Testament, Acts chapter 13, verse 36, and David after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. Don't you want that? What a great epitaph. And Elizabeth, after she had served the purpose of God in her own generation, fell asleep. Pastor Ray, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. I could put your name on that. What an amazing testimony of the life of a man who found and fulfilled the purpose of God. Now these were young, Joseph, David, they were young men when they were called. But we need to call the older people. Dr. Monroe says God's purpose is not, some of you say, well, I don't know, I've messed up so bad. I mean, I, you know, I'm still serving God, but I'm in my 70s, 80s, I don't know, I'm just getting old and I had many failures. Dr. Monroe says God's purpose is not hindered by your past. You are not too old to resume your purpose. Nothing you have done can cancel your purpose. The world is waiting on you to produce your purpose. The Bible is full of accounts of former failures who fulfill God's purpose. God turned a coward into a mighty leader in Gideon. He turned a rebellious runaway into a city-saving evangelist with no uh, with uh, Jonah. He turned a Samaritan woman into an evangelist, the woman at the well. He turned a Simon into a Saint Peter and a Saul into a Saint. Paul 
Turned out in every case they were born for such a time as this, even though their purpose wasn't fully revealed until they were into adulthood. Moses was wired to be a deliverer from his youth. He had it in him. He, he, God had prepared him with the heart of a deliverer, the heart of a rescuer. But as a young man, it wasn't time. He got ahead of God. So he saw one Egyptian persecuting one Jew and he wanted to deliver the Jew so he killed the Egyptian. What a victory. God's purpose was, was to deliver a nation. But it wasn't time. So in the sovereignty of God he was Thrust out into the desert, ends up in Midian, marries a woman and tends her father's sheep, the, the, her father's flock for 40 years. 40 years. He could have sat out there and said, well, I was really screwed up, man. Man, I shouldn't have killed that Egyptian. What am I doing out here? Well, I'm going to tell you something. God knew where he was. And when the time came, God appeared to him, recommissioned him, sent him back, and he delivered the nation. And he was 80 when God called him. I'll be 80 in a couple of years. The only thing I don't like about being 80 is Joe Biden's giving old men a bad name. <laughs> God has a divine purpose, not only for people, but for nations. Did you know God has corporate purpose? He has a purpose for every one of you in this generation, but he has a purpose for nations. Certain nations which uh, Lance Wild now calls sheep nations. He also has a purpose for goat nations, which isn't too cool. But I was thinking, I love to meditate on the founding father, the founding of this country. This nation was founded with covenants with God. And I want to submit this to you. Consider the confluence of courageous men rising up at the same time at the birthing of America. Our founding fathers included George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, James Hancock, Alexander Hamilton, Patrick Henry. I challenge you, look at these men, every one of them a hero, every one of them a man of God, every one of them a stalwart, a statesman. Find me even one of those today. Some people say, well, I don't, I know they say, well, God was in the founding of America, but you know, we were really founded in slavery. And I'm thinking, you mm, liar, lying spirit. The historians that are honest all admit there was something supernatural about the founding of this nation. And it started before the declaration in 1776. Go back and look at William Bradford. Look at the pilgrims. Look at the Puritans coming to America. Look at the Mayflower Compact. Go read the original constitutions of each one of the 13 colonies. Every one of them mentions God and has a covenant with God. This nation was founded with the purpose of evangelizing the world and expanding the kingdom of God. Man, yeah, but look what we've become today. That's right. But it doesn't take away the original purpose of the thing. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We need some statesmen today. 
And I believe they're out there. I believe they're like David on the hillside. I think they're like Moses in Midian. I think they're like Gideon threading, treading out the weed in the wine press. I believe they're hidden. I believe they're there. They, but they've been wired with purpose. We don't look for political salvation. But God does use political leaders. All right, I'm going to close. I'm really excited tonight. I guess you can tell. There are three Red Bulls. No, I was not. That was a joke. I want to close by switching gears from that focus on personal purpose to corporate purpose, national purpose. We're in a current crisis because American Christianity has been silent on the subject of purpose. Again, Francis P. Miller, years ago, true today, our failure as Christians to give man some adequate clue to the meaning of his earthly existence is the explanation of the underlying crisis of Western civilization. At this very moment, when, at the very moment when we are most inarticulate and silent on this subject, communism, the only serious rival of Christianity as a world religion, is passionately articulate. Have you noticed today the socialists, the communists, the fascist loons are more vocal and outspoken than they have ever been in the history of this country. Things are being said about America today that what men would have been run out of town for when I was a boy. They are speaking out and speaking up. You can't turn on the TV, watch the news. You can't pick up a newspaper without being subjected to the spewing of the worldview that hates America and hates God. But let me encourage you to know that God not only has a purpose for his people, he has a purpose for his enemies. I'm going to leave you with this. I cheated you on my text last week and this week. I only quoted the first part of Proverbs 16, 4. The part that says the Lord has made everything for its own purpose. I left out the rest. Even the wicked for the day of evil. <laughs> Think about that. What he's telling us is that God not only made his people for a purpose, he's got a purpose for evil people. And I've got, a, I've got news for these people. These enemies of God. It may seem to us today the wicked politicians in power are prevailing. They have a purpose and a plan to overthrow America and make it socialistic. But God's purpose trumps man's purpose. Trump's man's purpose. That's not a political endorsement. Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Oh, I just would like to write a letter. Nobody would read it up there, but I'd like to send a letter to so many of these people and say, I'm going to tell you something. Your plans, you've got many plans. You've got many purposes for the future of this nation that are evil, antichrist, anti-American, anti-biblical. But I've got news for you. God's plans will prevail. The Egyptian Pharaoh had a plan to keep God's people in bondage. God sent plagues and pestilence of judgment, but Pharaoh just seemed to survive all of it. But his doom was yet to come. Notice what God says to him in Exodus 9, 15, 16. God says, now if I had struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, Pharaoh, that I may show my power in you 
and that my name may be declared in all the earth. What was he talking about? God was saying the time for you to fulfill your purpose in my plan is not here yet. You live through the fire, the judgment, the worms, the frogs, the locusts, the f- water turning to blood. You live through the boils and uh, the plagues. But I've got news. I could have killed you with any of that, but I've got a better plan for you. I'm, I think I'm going to drown you in the Red Sea. <laughs> God only spared him for a season. And I'm telling you, it may seem like these people are prevailing now, but I've got news for you. God has a plan for them. He has a purpose for the evil. In the day of doom, there will be judgment. And that same thing then will happen again when God's enemies come to their judgment. Meanwhile, as we suffer for a season, remember Job who, with all he went through, never lost his faith that God would prevail. In Job 42, 2, he says, after all his suffering, losing his family, all his money, his health, he says, I know you, God, can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. I know some of you are listening to the prophets and some of you have heard, uh, have asked me about it. There are prophets of doom about America that are out there on the media, on the news. You know, they're out there. God will judge. All I can say is I have never believed that God's purpose for America is its destruction. I am fully persuaded that the purpose of God for this nation is to fulfill its original destiny and that she will do it. And when I look at the word of God about our backslidden condition, I still find grace. And I'll close with this, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. I'm just about done. For God says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the purpose, the future that I have for you. There are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity. And restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your own land. I take that for me and you as God's people in this nation today. We are here for such a time as this. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you, Lord, to restore your people, revive. Your church, awaken the house of God to a new sense of vision and destiny and purpose. I pray, Lord, that your mercy will visit this purposeless generation. I especially pray for our young people, Lord, that they would be recovered from the snares or the schemes of the enemy that has put them into a place of depression and uh, hopelessness and, and suicidal thinking. I, I pray for that release of your spirit, an awakening to purpose. And for those of us who are older, Lord, that you would cause us to know that our very existence, the fact that we're still alive, is evidence you're not through with us. We still have something to do to minister to this generation. And I thank you, God, you will fulfill all your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. I feel better now. Hallelujah.
Oh, I feel the baby is delivered. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. I want to bless you and release you. And if you need prayer, we'll be here for you.